name is Brandon Burke. I am a registered respiratory therapist from Springfield, Missouri. I'm currently the Director of Clinical Education for Respiratory Therapy Program at Ozarks Technical Community College. I have a master's degree in respiratory therapy from Northeastern University in Boston, and I'd like to thank you guys for uh, watching and viewing this presentation. The learning objectives for this presentation are to state the primary purpose of the AERC's clinical practice guidelines for suctioning. We're going to describe shallow suctioning. We're going to determine how to select the correct catheter size. We're going to identify the correct pressures for suctioning and how to set pressures correctly on the vacuum regulator itself. The guideline being discussed in this presentation was printed in Respiratory Care Journal in 2010. So the authors compiled 89 different studies to complete the guideline. I would encourage you to visit the AARC's website, it's www.aarc.org, to view the guideline for itself because while this presentation is going to cover the main points of it, there are several nuanced points that you uh, need to get by reading it on your own. So the main reason why this guideline was published was to prevent unintended adverse consequences that potentially could come from suctioning. So the main things that we're going to talk about today are either creating trauma directly to the airway by tearing some of the mucosal wall or causing atelectasis from using too much vacuum regulator pressure and actually suctioning air out of the lungs causing atelectasis. So allow me to describe the mechanism that causes the actual direct airway trauma. First, the way that I was taught in school to, to suction someone is to just advance the catheter all the way down the endotracheal tube until you meet resistance and or the patient starts to cough. When you do that, you actually have bumped into the carina, so you're, you're having the catheter actually touch the, the tracheal tissue. Then you withdraw the catheter a couple of centimeters and then apply suction and withdraw that catheter slowly and remove it. Part of the problem with that is, is that it actually potentially causes that airway trauma. So when you advance the catheter all the way down until you meet, that, meet the resistance, you're actually bumping into that carina, into the tracheal tissue. Then when you apply the suction pressure, it can actually adhere to that tracheal wall. When you apply the suction and remove the catheter, it will actually cause a disruption or tear into that tissue. And when that happens, it can cause bleeding and the inflammatory process to take place into that, into that area. And a lot of patients that are in, in the hospital on mechanical ventilators in the ICU already are susceptible to infection and they're at risk of developing complications that will increase their length of stay, that will increase their chance of morbidity and mortality. So whenever we are actually doing that, we are increasing that, those risks, so we should try to avoid those if at all possible. So besides the airway trauma, another common problem is we can actually cause the patient to develop atelectasis. And any time that we go down to suction, we're using negative pressure. So relative to the atmosphere, we're actually sucking air out of the patient's lungs. So whenever we advance the catheter, apply suction, we're actually removing some of the air from the lungs, which causes the airway to potentially collapse, or in the medical field, we call that atelectasis. So when we do that, we have to be very, very careful to not cause atelectasis as, as well as the tissue tearing. So now that we've discuss the two potential negative consequences that can occur from suctioning. Let's talk about ways that we can combat those. So the first thing I want to discuss, and maybe the most important thing, is that there needs to be an actual indication to suction someone. There needs to be evidence of secretions being present in the airway. So respiratory therapists, nurses are all, uh, we've all been guilty of doing this in the past where we have, a, we have a patient that might be coughing or we might uh, think they need to be suctioned or every time we go in there, we think, oh, this patient's really ill on the ventilator, so we need to suction them. And really, the evidence doesn't support that. We shouldn't routinely suction people uh, just because they have an endotracheal tube in place and they're on a mechanical ventilator. We really should have a, a positive indication that they have secretions present. And a few of those are, namely, if you can see secretions in the airway. So if they cough and you actually see those secretions go up into the tube, then obviously that's an indication to suction. The second one would be, you know, if you, if you listen to them with your stethoscope, you put your stethoscope on their chest and you hear uh, what we call ronchi or coarse crackles where it almost sounds like a snoring sound, then that's an indication they have secretions in the upper airway as well. The other one is uh, maybe the physician is requiring a sputum sample that, to send to the lab for culture and sensitivity so we can see um, if they have uh, anything growing that we, and what antibiotics that they need. So we would try to attempt to go down and suction them for that. And the other one might be that you can actually feel it. You can actually feel it with your hands, hear it without the aid of a stethoscope sometimes. Um, and also on the ventilator graphics, you can see that the, the flow scalars are kind of choppy. And all of those are indications to suction. And if you don't have those, then we should not suction them on a routine basis. So the next thing we want to discuss is proper depth to insert the catheter. As I discussed previously, the way that a lot of us were taught was to advance it until we met resistance or the patient coughed. 
But again, there are several problems with that. And I want to demonstrate for you here, uh, this is a standard endotracheal tube. It's a 7.0 that we would use on a lot of uh, adult patients. And this is just a standard inline suction catheter. It's a 14 French catheter. And I want to demonstrate for you a couple things. One is, if you insert this catheter all the way in, as far as it will go, it goes out several centimeters past the end of the endotracheal tube. And when endotracheal tubes are positioned correctly, they should be two to three centimeters above the level of the carina. And as you can see here, this catheter is significantly longer than that. So whenever, if, if you insert this all the way like I have it here, what will happen is it will either go down into their right main stem bronchus, or it will actually bump into the carina and curl over on itself, potentially kind of tying itself in a knot. And then, as we discussed previously, when you apply the suction pressure by depressing the button, it will actually adhere to the wall of the trachea, and when you remove it, it will actually tear that tissue away, causing bleeding, okay? So we want to avoid that if at all possible. So the way that you avoid it is, if you can see here, an endotracheal tube has centimeter markings on it, and a suction catheter has centimeter markings on it as well. And you can see those there. And what you want to do is you want to line those up because all they are is measuring the, the length of, of the respective tubes. So as you insert this catheter, you need to twist it around to where you can line the numbers up here. And I'm just going to line up the 25 with a 25. And you can see when you do that, the tube, the, the catheter is just at the end of the endotracheal tube. That way then when you apply suction, and withdraw it, you're ensuring that you're not coming into contact with any tracheal tissue whatsoever. So to quote the clinical practice guideline, they suggest to use shallow suctioning rather than deep suctioning when we, when we perform an endotracheal or tracheal suctioning. And the reason for that is based on neonatal and pediatric studies. They've been doing that for years. And I will tell you, just from a physiology and anatomy standpoint, the tissue from a neonate or a pediatric patient in their trachea is the exact same as it is for adult. So we shouldn't have two standards of care. We should, al we should always suction using shallow suction technique to make sure that we are preventing that airway trauma from occurring, which can potentially lead to detrimental uh, effects. So another important point is to consider the catheter size that you're using for the size of endotracheal tube or tracheostomy tube that you have in place in the patient. So the general guidelines should be that we use a catheter that occludes less than 50% of the inner lumen of the endotracheal tube. A good guideline to follow on that is to, to take the inner diameter of the endotracheal tube and multiply it by two, and then use the next smallest size catheter. So for example, if I had a patient that was intubated with a 7.5 inner diameter endotracheal tube, I would multiply that by two, so that would be 15, and then I would use the next smallest size, so a 14 French catheter would be acceptable for a 7.5 tube. But as you go smaller down in tube size, for example, if I had a, seven point, a patient intubated with a 7.0 endotracheal tube, a 14 French catheter would be too large in diameter, so I would need to use the next smallest size, which is a 12 French. And just a note, uh, suction catheter sizes in French go up by two, so you would use 14 French, 12 French, 10 French, and so on uh, as you go down the line. But for an adult, we should always, always remember to use a catheter that is less than 50% of the inner diameter of the endotracheal tube. So as you can see from the table, there are recommendations for endotracheal tube size and suction catheter size that would correspond with that. So you can see for a 7.5 tube and up, a 14 French catheter is acceptable. Uh, however, as you go to a 7 or a 6.5, a 12 French would be appropriate. And for a 6 or a 5.5 tube, a 10 French catheter would be appropriate. So the next thing we're going to discuss is setting suction pressure itself. The, the guideline would suggest that we should use the least amount of suction pressure as, as possible. And the recommendation is to use less than negative 150 millimeters of mercury in adult patients. The reason why we would want to do that, again, is to prevent that from atelectasis from occurring, or if we were to accidentally get um, the catheter onto the tracheal wall, we would it would prevent that tearing of the tracheal mucosa. As a general rule, the suction pressure setting should be, adults should be set between negative 100 and 120, pediatrics should be set between 80 and 100, and neonates should be between 60 and 80. Progressively, as you go down in, in size and patient population, you should also go down in suction pressure. In my experience, and unfortunately, suction pressure is seldom even a consideration. So frequently when you go in to check the suction pressure on a patient, it'll be set to full wall vacuum or any, anything in between. That is a problem because what frequently will happen is we generally don't even uh, consider what we're, what we're gonna be doing to the patient. Part of the reason is because we have patients that have multiple things that need to be uh, used for suction. So they'll have a chest tube, they'll have an, an NG or OG tube, they'll have a subglottic suction tube, they'll have an endotracheal tube, 
and they'll also have uh, an oral suction, a Yankauer suction catheter. And frequently, because the Yankauer suction catheter goes into the mouth, what will happen is that those, pa those pieces will actually be wide in together. And the main problem with that is that a Yankauer suction catheter can actually be used at full wall suction pressure because it's only used, made to suction out the mouth. And the mouth has very rigid tissue that is, that is used, that can handle, withstand a lot of pressure and a lot of trauma because we're used to eating and chewing in our mouth. However, those are typically wide in on the same canister as, as the inline suction catheter that we use to suction the airway. And if you use that much pressure, you can cause a lot of damage. So those two should be set at different pressures and really that practice of putting them on the same canister uh, is not really one that I would recommend because of the potential complications that can occur because they need to be using two different suction pressures. Now that we have discussed what suction pressure should actually be set at, how do we ensure that those suction pressures are set appropriately? So a question that I would ask you is, do you know how much full wall suction pressure is at your facility? And the reason why I asked is because I think that a lot of caregivers don't really know how powerful that the suction can be set at your hospital. And from, from various studies that we've looked at and, and talking to some of our local hospitals, it can be set as high as negative 635 millimeters of mercury of pressure. So I don't know if you've ever experienced that or if you've ever felt what that's like, but it is a significant amount of pressure. And there's no, there's no wonder why that if you suction with using that much pressure, it can cause a lot of trauma and bleeding in the tracheal tissue. One of the things that I've often observed in my practice is that a patient that's intubated for several days uh, that have been fre frequently suctioned, they will end up developing blood tinge in their sputum. So as you suction them, you'll get the normal secretions that you normally would, but you'll see that there will be little tinges of blood in there. And typically that is not because of a new pathology that they have, it's because they've developed that from the trauma from us from suctioning them repeatedly over the course of several days. So we very, full wall suction pressure is extremely, extremely negative. So we need to be careful and we need to make sure we set it appropriately. So let's talk about now, how do we actually set that appropriately? And what I'm gonna do for you is demonstrate a couple of ways that we can do it. The first one is that we should always use what we call a clue to set. And what that means is that we should always remove the suction tubing from the actual suction catheter that we're using, occlude the end of it with our thumb, and then adjust the suction pressure as appropriate to get it down to, on, in adults, we wanna make sure it's less than a negative 150 millimeters of mercury. The other way is actually using a, a special type of, of suction regulator that's called push to set, where you actually press into the, the knob. As you turn the knob after you compress it, it will actually adjust the pressure on its own. So when you press the knob in, it actually is doing the occlusion process for you, and then you can adjust it. And what you're doing there is you're setting a pressure limit. And that is a really nice feature to have because it's actually doing that pro process for you so you're not actually having to remove any tubing. And you can do it right there at the suction regulator in one, in one move instead of having to, to take, away, take off pieces of tubing and occlude it. So another thing that I wanna demonstrate for you is how powerful full wall suction pressure can actually be when you suction. So what we have for you today, I'm ventilating a set of actual real pig lungs here with a mechanical ventilator and I have them on some, some pretty significant settings like you would find on a patient that has ARDS in the hospital. We have them on a low tidal volume and a really high peep. We have them on a peep of 20. And you see here that the lungs are inflated during ventilation. However, what I'm gonna demonstrate here is as I advance the catheter, I'm gonna apply suction at full wall and I'm only gonna apply it for a few seconds and I want you to watch at what actually happens to these lungs during this procedure. So as you can see, just a few seconds of suction pressure there, full wall suction pressure, will actually completely de-recruit the lung. So again, we shouldn't be using suction pressure that's too negative, and we definitely should not be suctioning patients fre more frequently than, they, than is indicated. So I realize that this presentation so far has been about all of the negative things that can come from suctioning. And what I really want to discuss with you are how to prevent those things from happening. And really the way to do that is if, as long as we follow proper procedure, then we can avoid all these complications and hazards. So again, the first thing that we need to make sure is that we have an indication to suction. The best way to avoid complications of suctioning is to not suction someone when there's not an indication. However, the patients that have endotracheal tubes are going to need to be suctioned on occasion. So when we do that, we need to make sure that we follow a checklist. So one of the first things you should do once you have an indication is to pre-oxygenate them using 100% oxygen in adults. So 
Most of the time on a mechanical ventilator, there's a button that you can push. So you'd press that button, it, it increases the FiO2 up to 100% for uh, usually two to three minutes. So what you should do is push the button, wait for about a minute or so, and then go ahead and suction them. And the reason for that is because as you suction them, you potentially are gonna cause a little bit of atelectasis, and it can actually give them a potential dysrhythmia, a heart dysrhythmia if you don't do that. So you should pre them for a few seconds before you, before you suction. Again, you should also use shallow suction. So you should always match up those numbers on the endotracheal tube with the numbers on the catheter like we described earlier. Another thing is you need to make sure that before every single suctioning procedure that you check to ensure that you're not using too much suction pressure. Uh, how many times do we go in, we set the suction pressure, and another caregiver um, has come in behind us and maybe adjusted it for, for one reason or another. So the only way to ensure that it's being done, done appropriately every single time is to check it before every time that you suction. So to prevent atelectasis, we should either use the occlude to set or push to set suction procedure. We should use a pressure of less than 150 millimeters of mercury in adults. We should use a catheter that occludes less than 50% of the inner diameter of the endotracheal tube. And we should keep our suctioning duration to a minimum, which is less than 15 seconds. The best way to prevent the hazards and complications of suctioning is to make sure that you have a, an appropriate policy and procedure in place and follow it and hold people accountable to it. So you should always use either the occlude to set procedure that we discussed earlier or the push to set, depending on whatever technology that, you have, that you're using in your facility. So to summarize this presentation, hospital vacuum can be very powerful. Remember, it can be up to negative 635 millimeters of mercury. So as you saw from the pig lung demonstration, we should always make sure that we, we are checking that before every procedure. Endotracheal tube suctioning is not benign. As, as you can see, we can cause a lot of damage. We can cause atelectasis. We can cause all the direct airway trauma. When you use a higher than recommended suction pressure or inappropriately large suction catheter, it will increase the risks of those hazards associated with endotracheal tube suctioning. The only way to guarantee that a pressure limit is set on a suction regulator is to either use the occlude to set technique or the push to set technique at the suction regulator. I would like to thank you all for viewing this presentation. I hope that you find this information useful in your own practice. Please contact me anytime with any questions you might have. I'd be happy to hear from you. Thank you.